Okay, so uh, we'll go on. Uh, unfortunately for you, according to the, to the criteria I described at the beginning, that I'm one of the speakers too. Um, and I'm going to really follow up on uh, Andre's talk, uh, focusing on the microlensing aspect. So a lot of the introduction uh, he already gave, so that will save me time. Um, so uh, this is uh, work that I will work that is that I will describe was led by my former student Yossi Schwarzwald, who's now at JPL, uh, together with uh, the Ogil and Moa and our local Wise teams, microlensing teams, and it was described in a in the paper that was published uh, uh, last year, <clears throat> uh, led by Yossi and uh, with me and Andre and the other members of the team. So, um, uh, if if we uh, look at try to look at the broader picture of why why do we want to find uh, planets via microlensing, it's for the same reason we want to find planets with the other techniques. It's to understand the general uh, pla ex extrasolar planet landscape and to understand how planetary systems, including our own, formed. So this is a mo more or less uh, updated picture of the known uh, uh, extrasolar planets. Uh, with their masses and their separations from their host stars uh, via the various techniques. And in the letters here, you see the planets in our own solar system. So Earth is here, Venus, uh, Saturn, Jupiter, and so on. Um, so one of the interesting things that you see from this plot is that uh, most of the, of the known pla extrasolar planets are still in a rather different part of parameter space from the planets in our own solar system, okay, with the ex exclusion maybe of Jupiter that's inside that cloud. Uh, another thing you can see is that the red points, which are the micro, some of the microlensing planets that have been discovered, are probably the closest ones to the planets in our solar system. So that shows you one reason why it's important to find uh, uh, planets via microlensing. It's because we're probing uh, a very important part of parameter space, a planetary parameter space, that's similar to the planets that we know and love and we're, we're part of. Another way of looking at this same plot that was already done many years ago by, by Andy Gould is to, is to renormalize the horizontal axis, uh, dividing it by some uh, mass, the mass of the, of the lens star to some power which is some way of, of indicating where the snow line is, the, the, the radius around the star around which ice condensates can form, and therefore there you can form giant planets. And when you do that, you can see that the microlensing planets uh, all line up uh, more or less around, uh, this, uh, around one snow line radius, one or a few. Okay, so in our solar system, this corresponds to about five AU, uh, but most microlensing host stars are M stars, simply because those are the most common stars in, in our galaxy. And so microlensing basically probes for planets in about a 1 AU region uh, around low mass stars. So this is a, a very unique part of parameter space that's, that's, that's probed especially by microlensing. So it's another reason, it's, it's very complementary uh, to the other methods. Um, so, <clears throat> Why does this appear again? Okay, so here's uh, uh, the first microlensing event discovered uh, that Andre already showed, but up there you actually see the movie uh, over about two months of the star the flashing twice and then brightening, brightening again, and then uh, going back to its normal brightness, very, very faint normal brightness. Uh, and uh, as Andre showed, these are the real data from this event in 2003, data from uh, the, the Ogle survey in red and from MOA in New Zealand in blue. Uh, and th this will be my only slide, again, explaining how, how microlensing uh, works in this animation, explaining this particular event. So the, the blue, blue spot that you see running in the background, that's the position of the real position of the star. Two purple points are the lensed images, and one of the lensed images happens to pass next to a planet that's right there, which produces more splitting, more, more, more image splitting, more magnification, 
and, and produces uh, these two so-called uh, lensing anomalies from the regular Pachinsky curve, the symmetric Pachinsky curve. Okay, and you can also see plotted there that red uh, uh, diamond shape. That's the caustic structure that you see that when every time the source crosses it, you get these uh, formerly infinite magnifications that cause these spikes. And this uh, complex structure of the light curve is actually a good thing because that means that you can reconstruct from a, an event like this when it's well observed the parameters of the system. The, interesting, inter, the physically interesting parameters that you get from microlensing are the mass ratio of the star, of your lens star and your planet and their separation. So it's actually quite similar to radial velocity planet measurements. Okay, where you also get a mass ratio and a separation. Uh, with some degeneracies both there and here, but we'll maybe get to that later. Okay, so I'll show, very quickly show some additional uh, of, the, of the historically discovered uh, uh, ex exoplanets through microlensing. Uh, I think all of them Andre showed, showed as well. Um, <clears throat> and he, this was the first... Uh, uh, the, the first uh, planetary system discovered by microlensing uh, in 2008. It's a, a Jupiter-like and a Saturn-like planet around, again, an, a lower mass star, an M star. Um, and a few years uh, ago, a, the second two-planet system was discovered. So again, you see now the, the, the light curve is even more complicated because of the more complex caustic structure. Um, Okay, so today there's only about uh, 50 microlensing planets that have been discovered, uh, including the ones that I will mention today. And, and the question arises, you know, why so few, especially compared to the thousands that have been found by other techniques? But of course, you know, if we were asking this question only 10 years ago, 50 would already be a pretty good number. So we have to keep, keep these things in, in, in perspective. Okay, but the, the, the reason why the number is so few is that uh, until... Until uh, recently, uh, the survey strat strategy for finding exoplanets through microlensing was the so-called first-generation survey strategy, which focused on finding events that promise to be very high magnification events, meaning they're going to be magnified to of order 100 or, or even more. And um, in fact, most of the events that I just flashed to, for example, this one, or, or this one, or this one. Uh, if, you, if you look at the scale, let's go back. Okay, this is, uh, there's like four or five magnitudes uh, magnification. That's a factor of 100, five magnitudes. Okay, so these are all uh, uh, high magnification events. <clears throat> and the idea in this survey strategy was to find, uh, uh, to, 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 to monitor a large area uh, towards the bulge with these two observatories, with Ogle in Chile and Moa in New Zealand, with a low cadence that was possible, that was the only thing possible until recently, about once, once a night. Okay, so you look at the galactic center, you tile it as, uh, as uh, Andre showed, uh, you find microlensing events, and a few hundreds were found every year, and then you focus on those that promise to be a very bright, high magnification rays. You see, you see the light curve starts to going up, going up really sharply, and you predict that it's going to be uh, high magnification. Okay, and in terms of uh, this passage of the source star behind the lens star, high magnification means you're passing very, very close to the line of sight of the source star. Okay, so it would be this, this trajectory here. Okay, and in terms of caustic language, it means that uh, your source is going to pass, is going to cut through the central caustic of the caustic structure that's produced by the combination of the star's gravitational potential and the planet that's somewhere out here, okay, that's producing this whole caustic structure that's kind of hard to see, okay? And the good thing, uh, and, and, and the idea was then that once you identify such an event, then you alert a global network of small telescopes as, it's turned, as it turned out, many of them are even amateur telescopes uh, that follow up this event to look for the anomalies 
the, the, the lensing anomalies that will indicate there's an extrasolar planet around the lens star. Okay? Now, why was this a good idea? Uh, so high magnification vents are, are good because when you have uh, this, kind of, this kind of passage, this very low impact parameter passage near, uh, near your lens star, you're basically lensing your background star into an almost complete Einstein ring. Okay, and that means that if you have a planet anywhere along, remember that first animation I showed with the image passing near the planet and getting split? If, you're, if your image is split into a whole Einstein ring, then it doesn't matter anywhere you put the planet, it will, it will uh, perturb that ring and you'll see a lensing anomaly. So, so uh, these, these events uh, have a very high uh, sensitivity uh, to planets projected anywhere near the Einstein. If there's a planet there and you have a high magnification event, you'll see it. Okay, so it's almost 100% sensitivity. And it's also good because making the source 100 times brighter than it really is can give you a very high signal to noise uh, ratio, even when you're observing with very small telescopes. So that's good. And uh, another reason that's a little, a little more uh, complex is that whenever you have these caustic crossings, you can also say something about, about the, the, the size of your Einstein ring and then uh, translate your results into an actual mass for your lens star, not just a mass ratio. But that's another point. Okay, the problem with this approach is that almost by definition, high magnification events are rare. Okay, events that, that, that have uh, a factor of 100 magnification occur about 1% of the time. Okay, so you're already throwing away the large majority of all your lensing events in terms of searching them for planets. Okay, and this, this transla translated uh, to, if we're talking about, you know, we said 650 events a year, microlensing events in total, so you're in advance already throwing away 99% of them, you're left just with seven events a year that you monitor, and not all of them have planets in the snow line region, so people were finding only one or two planets a year. Okay, and that was the, the reason why there were only, until a few years ago, there were only like a dozen or two planets known. Okay, and another problem with this approach is that this whole uh, social construct of how, how you look for planets is very uh, chaotic and subjective, okay? Because uh, you have to decide in advance that something is gonna be high magnification and you have to alert your network. Sometimes you do it more successfully, sometimes less. The, the follow-up is very erratic. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the very fact that you get a lot of follow-up is related to the fact that people already noticed there's an anomaly, that there's a chance for, for a planet there. And then how do you account that? when you want to, complete, to, to, to turn all this into a statistical inference on, on the planet population, on planet frequency, and the planet mass distribution, and so on. Okay, so um, <clears throat> as opposed to, to these uh, high, high uh, magnification events that occur 1% of the time, the majority of microlensing events are low, low uh, 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 magnification events, okay? such as uh, you know, this trajectory here for the source star uh, behind the lens star, or this trajectory here, okay? So they, they pass far away, they have low magnification. And the problem with these is that they have also low planetary efficiency detection, okay? Because this trajectory, for example, it cuts across the caustic structure, which you can barely see, that's here. So you would see an anomaly here Okay, because the planet happens to lie here, but if for the same event the trajectory was here, you would see nothing. Okay, basically your image, none of your lensed images pass near a planet. So nothing happens to the light curve and you don't know the planet is there. So they have a lower planet detection efficiency compared to the high magnification events, but they are much, much more common. Okay, and in the balance, there's a potential for many more, an order of magnitude more, uh, plan planetary detections using this method. Okay, so this led to the idea of uh, second generation uh, microlensing, <clears throat> uh, which, which is to, instead of, uh, uh, of monitoring with low cadence 
uh, the galactic bulge and spotting the events that are going to be high magnification, uh, monitor uh, the, whole the whole galactic bulge or a large region of the galactic bulge continuously uh, and get very, very good cadence observations of all the lensing events. Okay? And after the fact, you can then go to them and see which ones of them had anomalies and which ones did not. Uh, and, this, and, and as opposed to the, to the previous very chaotic way of doing things, this would be a real controlled experiment uh, for finding planets uh, doing microlensing. Okay, so in 2011, uh, we teamed up, we meaning WISE Observatory here in Tel Aviv, uh, we teamed up with uh, Ogle and with MOA, uh, and we found a region of the sky uh, that's mon that, that, that would be monitored by, with high cadence by, by all three observatories. Uh, and uh, at our respective longitudes, we can basically cover the, the galactic bulge during the summer uh, 24 hours, basically. Okay? So we won't be missing any uh, anomalies or, or not sampling those anomalies when they occur uh, uh, completely. Okay, and uh, this is again the, the center of our galaxy. Uh, sorry. Uh, and uh, these uh, colored squares are uh, the fields with the highest lensing rates uh, found by Ogle in previous seasons. Uh, and uh, on top of that, the red thing is the, the, the red area is the WISE footprint. So that's the area that was covered by all three observatories. And we did this for, uh, here you see it here, the, the, the three different footprints to cover eight square degrees in the galactic bulge. Um, so we did this for four, uh, actually five seasons, uh, five summers, uh, each time for about three months in a row. That's the time that we can see the galactic center from here from our rather northern latitude. Uh, so just to show you an example, here's an uh, actual image from uh, WISE, uh, if we'll focus in, and here's uh, an event uh, brightening and fading again, and then in the bottom row you see the difference image, uh, so it's coming up and going back down. Uh, here's the actual light curve from WISE, with about, <clears throat> every night we have about half, uh, half hour cadence, so we, we can see this uh, of order 10 times a night. Uh, but you see the internight gaps over a period of, uh, of about two months, uh, or, or in this case, it's even less, one month. Uh, and uh, when you put the other observatories, you see you have this really nice and, and complete coverage of this event, except for uh, the gap in the middle, which is full moon, uh, where nobody observes. Uh, and of course, you can see the very clear uh, un planetary anomaly that's, that's detected there. Okay, so um, we, ha we found many of these. Uh, here are some uh, typical uh, low magnification events now. Look at the magnification on the left axis. So we're no longer talking about magnification 100 events. You know, these are just the typical magnification few events that, you, that, that one sees. Uh, and the data from all three observatories, and you see the nice coverage where in these cases there is no anomaly. Okay, these are things that were no uh, planetary anomalies that were detected. Uh, overall, our, our final sample after four seasons uh, over these years was over 200 events. Uh, so they're all, all shown here over the four years. Uh, 29 of these are uh, anomalous. Have the, we can see that it's not a, just a point lens, but there's something else next to the lens. In most of these cases, it's, uh, it's a binary star. There's, there's another star next to the lens, a stellar companion, but none of them are likely planetary. Um, so just some examples of these uh, planetary uh, discoveries from our Generation 2 project. So this is the one I already showed you. Uh, <coughs> here's another one. Um, several of these also Andre showed. So here's another one. Uh, uh, sort of sub-Jupiter, sub uh, Saturn or Jupiter planet around an M-dwarf. Uh, here's a 4-Jupiter mass at around 1 AU. All these are, are around a few AUs. This is a slightly higher mass star, uh, 0.8 solar masses. Uh, 
uh, and, and many, oh, most of these have been published uh, individually. There's a super Jupiter. It's almost a brown dwarf. Maybe it even is a, is a brown dwarf. Uh, 12 Jupiter masses, uh, and so on. Okay, so as expected, we found a bunch of these. We found some interesting ones too, like, like this one that Andre also showed. This is, uh, again, just a half, half Jupiter mass, uh, 3 AU, around a 0.7 solar mass star. Uh, but as, as Andre showed, this was observed simultaneously uh, by Spitzer from a different location in the, solar, in the solar system so that it happened at a different time and at a different impact parameter. So you see this, this uh, anomaly feature, this big dip, it occurred uh, a few days, a few days earlier, and at a different amplitude, and that that is very useful for uh, for getting rid of some of the degeneracies and the physical parameters that always plague micro microlensing. Uh, and Andre already showed this one of a, of a planet around uh, around one member of of a, of a binary system, um, and act actually a, an Earth-like planet. <clears throat> anyway, so we have we have this sample of uh, of uh, <coughs> lens stars uh, and the detections of uh, planetary anomalies around some of them, and the idea now is to carry out our, our objective of actually saying something about planetary demographics. What fraction of the stars that uh, that produce micro microlensing events uh, host planets? Uh, of what masses, what separations, and so on. Okay, so the first step in a in a controlled experiment like this is actually to build an, an algorithm for objective anomaly detection. Okay, because without that, we won't be able to actually gauge what what the efficiency of our experiment is. Uh, so Yossi did this, and this is an example of uh, fitting. Uh, one of these microlensing light curves uh, with uh, just a point, point, point lens uh, microlensing curve. Uh, it's not symmetric because one of the things you have to take into account is the possibility of uh, terrestrial parallax, the effect of what? Three minutes. Three minutes? You're the chairman? No, I am uh, the <laughs> <laughs> But who appointed you? Oh, <laughs> the chairman. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm almost done. Um, okay, so uh, this, is, this is due to base, basically to the Earth's acceleration around, around the sun. This has to be taken into account. Okay, but this is uh, the event I already showed you uh, where the, the purple points show you how the algorithm actually detects automatically this very, very conspicuous anomaly that one can see by eye anyway. Okay, but we applied this algorithm to all the events, all the 200 and so events, and we found all the anomalous events. So here are a few more examples. You see all these uh, very clear anomalies. And you see, uh, maybe you don't see the model fits to, to each light curve from which one can determine the parameters of the system, the interesting parameters, the, the mass ratio and the separate and the separation, okay? So here, here are a few that are not, not so conspicuous, but these are still anomalous events where it's not a point uh, lens, okay? So the big question, of course, is, uh, you know, what is the true frequency of planets around microlensing uh, host stars that's implied by this detection of nine planets around in, in 200 events in this generation two uh, experiment? So to answer that question, as in, as in any experiment in physics, you have to uh, determine what is the efficiency of your experiment, and the only way to do that is through a simulation that takes into account all the all the parameter all the observational parameters of your experiment. Uh, so we did that. We for every event, for every micro, every one of these 200 events, we simulated a physical system where we add to that event planets of many different masses and of ma many different locations in the plane. Uh, around the planet, ray traced through those, uh, and produced uh, these microlensing uh, light curves, okay, which we then, quote, observed with the same parameters of our experiment, meaning with the same sampling sequ sequences, including the moon gaps and everything, 
uh, of, that, of that very event. We did it for each event with its parameters and with noise. And then we ran these events through our uh, anomaly detection uh, algorithm, okay, and found what fraction of, of those we found for every range in parameter space, of so physical parameter space of the plants, we actually recover. Okay, so this is an example. Uh, this, for example, the, the, the central curve here would be the detection efficiency for one particular uh, lensing event as a function of the mass ratio between the planet and the host star. Okay, so you, you see that, uh, for example, for, for Jupiter mass planets that are around here, okay, you discover a planet if it's there 10 or 20 percent of the time. Okay, and of course, every, every event has its own uh, efficiency curve. <clears throat> and uh, then if you, if you want to ask what is the planet frequency for a given mass ratio, okay, you just take the number of planets that you detected with that mass ratio and divide it by the sum of all the efficiencies. So it's very simple. And uh, this is the main result of this experiment. Okay, this is the, the mass distribution of... Uh, of companions to the host stars, whether planets or stellar, or stellar binary companions, uh, as, a as a function of mass ratio. So the dark area is, is the actual numbers detected. And you see that they're very low, okay? Th these are uh, star everything to the left of this bin here, that's the planets. These are, these are, these are stars, right? So mass ratios of one or one-tenth. These are stellar companions. These are the planets. And, uh, and you have them written up there, too. Okay? So there's brown dwarfs, Jupiters, Neptunes, and Earths. Okay? So these are the nine, and the numbers are very low. Okay? One, one, three, two, two. Uh, and the, the unshaded histogram is what you get after you correct for that efficiency as a function of mass ratio that I, that I just discussed. Okay? So, of course, the lower the mass of your planet, the lower the efficiency, and therefore, the higher the correction factor. Okay, so here, at the very end, you have already quite, you know, very large correction factors of 100, which are, of course, very uncertain, because then you have to know your efficiency very well. Okay, but here, it's not so bad. Okay, it's just a factor of a few, and for the, for the stellar binaries, it's small factors. You basically, you find everything when it's there. Okay, and the interesting uh, thing that comes out of this uh, is, first of all, because the numbers are so small, you can't really say much. I mean, you could pass a, a horizontal line through these points, right, and it would be okay, and that's just the result of the fact that we're still talking about very small numbers. Nevertheless, the distribution, the corrected distribution is suggestive of these two populations that have already been seen in in planetary studies and, and binary companion studies using other techniques, using RVs, for example. Um, <coughs> for example, um, <coughs> uh, in this famous study by Grather and Einweaver 10 years ago based on RVs, you also see these two populations that are separated by this so-called brown dwarf desert. Okay? Uh, where there seem to be very, small, very few uh, brown dwarfs in orbits up to five years. So it's more or less the same separations we're talking about here with microlensing uh, around uh, FGK stars. Okay? And we're seeing a very similar picture, only the difference is that this is not a brown dwarf desert, if there's a desert here at all. That's arguable. It seems to be like a super Jupiter desert, rather. Okay? Because remember, we're talking here mostly about M stars. Okay, so this, 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 mass, this, this mass ratio of minus 2 here c c corresponds to super Jupiter as well. White brown dwarfs actually do have a signal. Okay? As I showed you, many of the detections that we have of planets are of planets around brown dwarfs. Oh, of, sorry, of, of companions to the lens stars are of uh, brown dwarf companions. So th there, there are really quite a few of these. So all, all this is, uh, is suggestive. Uh, of, of this whole, the picture that we see in uh, FGK stars simply shifting to the left for lower mass stars. Okay? Um, another thing you can uh, uh, get out of this is just the absolute frequencies 
which you can say now, thanks to the fact that we've done these, these efficiency calculations. So it looks like there's about 5% uh, of uh, these low mass stars ho host Jupiters. But now we're talking about you know, the slow, slow snow line region, uh, same as in our solar system. And about 10 times as many host Neptunes. Neptunes are the most common planets that we're finding in the snow line region. So it could be, you know, there's a large uncertainty there again. It could be, you know, 25%, but it could be even 100% of, uh, of these low mass stars uh, host Neptunes. Brown dwarfs, as I said, are quite common, about 5%, uh, much, more, uh, much more common than we see in uh, more massive stars. And the stellar companions are 10% uh, or so. Uh, and, and again, all, all these numbers are, are quite consistent except for the brown dwarf part, are quite consistent with what's been seen uh, with other techniques. So it's, it's, it's filling in the picture, but it's doing it in a, in a place of parameter space that wasn't quite well probed by the other methods. Um, so here's my conclusions. Uh, this idea of second generation microlensing, which has been around for a while, it really does work. And you can produce, you can do a controlled experiment for, for determining the planetary population using microlensing. Uh, there's about 5% of microlens stars that host Jupiters, about half of them host Neptunes. Uh, the super Jupiters seem to be playing the role of, of the brown dwarf desert. They're rare. Uh, while brown dwarf companions are actually more common than you find in FGK stars. And there's this hint, it's, it's just a hint, not more than that, of this uh, two population companion picture, a planetary companion population and a stellar companion population, presumably from two uh, different formation avenues. Okay, thank you. That, that's, that's true for, you know, solar mass stars. So these masses you find that they're actually And other people have too. It's, 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 it's been known for a long time. I mean, the, the fraction increases with mass, and when you, when you go to more massive stars, it seems like they're all in binaries. Yeah. I mean, ask, ask Boaz about this. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you, that's, that's really where, you know, our statistics dwindle out. Um, but uh, shortly after our study, uh, there came out a, another very similar uh, analysis by the MOA group. Um, they did its things slightly different. Instead of doing a, a real second generation survey, they used only MOA data for detection. So they have incomplete coverage. Uh, they used a longer time period. Uh, and fainter events. So overall, they have, uh, they have uh, about seven times more events that they've analyzed than we did, okay? but they have only two and a half times more planets okay? because they're less efficient. So it, it's a slightly complementary way of doing things. And this is the, this is the analogous curve that they got. Um, this was just published very recently. Um, Okay, and, and one of their main claims is, is actually exactly pertinent to your question. Uh, they, they claim there is a break uh, lowered of Neptunes. Okay, and, and here they, they, they give a lot of uh, weight to these upper limits that they get here where they found nothing. Okay, and then they put the correction on the nothing uh, to get these upper limits up there. And they say, well, this is very significant. So I, I don't know if I believe this because it's all based again, you know, on one and zero and so on. Uh, but it's, there's possible that there really is a break there. At least that, that's the claim. Uh, Boaz. Sorry. Yeah, this is, this is in the range of separations. Well, you know, in microlensing, you measure a separation scale to the Einstein radius. 
Okay, so. Yeah, it's between, uh, no, it's less. It's, it's from about uh, 0 0.5 to 2. Okay, so and this, and this corresponds in, in uh, M stars to, you know, 1 to a few AU. And this means this would be like, let's say, 10% of that, right? Yeah. That's right. This is, this is only the snow line region, which is defined as, you know, a few, a few AU around, around so 1 AU. If you look at all separations, of course, yeah. Two. Oh, okay, okay. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, the 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 okay the, the binarity of low mass stars those those measured by other techniques is also in a limited range. Okay, so that's why the percentages are, are similar, I think. But, but I, I, I understand your point. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. You know, what is the exact uh, factor that you should need to correct by? Yeah, yeah Aviv. Um, what are you expecting to study from future like W first? And Well, that, well, I don't think any others are, are are possible. But even those are not really possible yet. You you get you get true masses and separations only for a fraction of those events where you've managed to measure so-called secondary effects, which are finite source effects, parallax, or some follow-up high-resolution high imaging in which you can actually identify the lens star. Uh, usually, you're you're degenerate in these parameters. Okay, but when, when you're not degenerate, then yeah, all you can get is the projected separation. Okay, this is not the not the orbit size; it's not the same thing, uh, and and the mass. Uh, now, the, the w, w first will 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 be good because. Uh, do, do you want to answer that question, uh, Andre? Right. So, so So, so, so the main advantage will be that you, you, can, you can see more of these secondary effects that remove degeneracies. Plus, you'll be doing this in the infrared, where you can, where you can look uh, closer to the, to the galactic plane through the extinction, where, where you, both things get brighter and you have a higher density of stars, so you have more events. Um, yeah, so overall, it'll be larger numbers and more precise uh, determinations of, of the physical parameters. I think that's the answer. And much more precise right, which will also help you for, for getting better parameters. Yeah. I, think, I think my time is way up. So uh, the next speaker is uh, Tzvi Maze. You know, that, that's why. <laughs> Thank you. That's, a, that's, a, 